What's up boys, welcome back to my channel. Today I'm on Madden 24 and we're going to see what would happen if everyone in the NFL had to play for the state they were born in. I'll put each of these teams in a single game elimination tournament and the computer will decide which state is the best at football. I looked through all 3,174 players in the game for this. That's right, I'm a virgin in this life and probably the next. Out of the 50 states, every one of them had at least one player except Vermont. For a state to qualify for a team, they need to have at least 22 players, which left us with 30 eligible states from Kentucky with 23 players to California, who is home to about 10% of the league. I ranked all 30 teams by the average overall of their top 10 players, and this is what the seeding came out looking like. Louisiana and Texas are at the 1 and 2 seed and will receive a first round bye. Number 3, Georgia faces the worst state with a team, number 30, Oregon. At 4 and 5, we have Florida and California. And at number six, we have Ohio. How I did this is I put the teams matched up with each other into a franchise mode together. The difficulty will always be set to all pro. Progression is turned off, but training is on, which means all players will improve by the time they play in their elimination game. Also home field advantage and injuries will be turned off. Every first round game will be six minute quarters, second round will be nine, third will be 12, and the semifinals and final will be 15 minute quarters. For the first couple of games, I tested the idea of filling in the roster holes with kickers, which wasn't my brightest idea. But by the third or so game, I had it all figured out. If a team needed a position filled, I would go to free agency and sign the worst available player in that needed position. Up first, we have 16 South Carolina taking on number 17, Illinois. Illinois is led by Taron Armstead and Kirk Cousins with also some solid skill position players. South Carolina, on the other hand, is loaded with defense and star wide receivers. The only problem is they have Mason Rudolph starting at QB. The very first play of the tournament almost results in a touchdown. Illinois forgot how to tackle, but thankfully one of those Chicago-born players was able to take him down at the 30. But with such good starting field position, Mason Rudolph was able to make a few simple throws that resulted with Mike Williams scoring the first touchdown. Illinois got the ball in the 15-yard line, but Ezekiel Elliott was able to move the ball past midfield. On third and seven from the 20-yard line, Kirk Cousins found Cole Komet, who ended up just short of the first down. Surprisingly, they don't go for it on fourth down, which brings a game to three to seven. South Carolina is back on offense they give it to Cordell Patterson who gets past the line of scrimmage, spins past three defenders, and flips a field. Rudolph throws for the first down on third and two, but followed that up with a negative 10-yard sack. Illinois calls a timeout. South Carolina kicks it from 51 yards out, and they miss it. With a minute to go in the half, Illinois works in a few first downs up the sideline. Kolkomed brings it within the 15-yard line, but the best they can do before halftime is make a field goal, which makes it a one-point game. Out of halftime, Rudolph finds Mike Williams wide open downfield, but Madden said not today, so he ran out of bounds with plenty of room to run. But Rudolph once again is looking like prime Tom Brady with the receivers he has today. He finds DeAndre Hopkins near the end zone, which lands him on the one-yard line, and that gives them an easy run-in touchdown to put South Carolina up 6-14. to 14. Illinois has it on 2nd and 11. Alec Pierce is telling Kirk Cousins to give him the ball. So Kirk throws it his direction and Alec just stands there, which results in a South Carolina interception and a pick 6 by Stephon Gilmore. Illinois isn't entirely out of it yet though. They're down 6-21. to 21. They work their way all the way up to the 3-yard line. And on 1st and goal, they give it to Ezekiel Elliott who fumbles it near the end zone and yeah, that'll do it. South Carolina won this one 6-21 to 21, thanks to their defense, but in the next round they'll be facing number one ranked Louisiana. Up next we have number nine Mississippi facing number 24 New York. I wasn't forcing wins for each team at this point so everyone on the field is a little depressed and downgraded. New York is led by Saquon Barkley, Matt Milano, and Daniel Jones. Mississippi is led by AJ Brown, Chris Jones, and I decided to move DK Metcalf to tight end to fill that gap, but the man throwing them the ball is Gardner Minshew. Mississippi started off with the ball and gained an easy first down on the ground. They were moving quickly, but Gardner was pressured. He avoided the sack, and they came out of this drive with three points. New York obviously has a lot of offense to keep up with, so Daniel Jones had to step up his game. So he went ahead and threw an uncatchable pass on second down, and on third, Saquon ran the wrong way for negative three yards. Mississippi starts off strong again with a 20-yard pass to DK. Gardner starts to feel the pressure again, so he turns on the burners and dives face first into a first down. And again, Gardner can't find an open man in his all-pro wide receiver room, so he runs it in himself for a first down. 
They then get stopped near the red zone and settle for another field goal. We're in the second quarter and Daniel Jones finally completes his second pass for a first down. He does it again near the sideline and New York is in scoring range. But on second and nine, Chris Jones runs over a grown man, causes a fumble. New York recovers it, but it costs them eight yards and forces them to punt. Mississippi has their back on the end zone. Garner spins for no reason, but screw it. AJ Brown is down there somewhere. And with just over a minute left in the half, Mississippi does really well for themselves, hitting one big completion after another that once again ends up in a short field goal. And in the last quarter, New York fights for every yard to get the ball within scoring range. They end up with fourth and goal with a minute and a half left. Jones actually throws a laser to the end zone, but even though it was in that man's hands, he did not feel like catching it. So Mississippi will advance after scoring an impressive zero touchdowns. Getting into a field goal shootout with Mississippi in the next round is between number 25, Missouri, and number eight, New Jersey. New Jersey is pretty well-rounded with Minka Fitzpatrick, Jonathan Taylor, and Joku, but their main setback is Kenny Pickett. I live in Missouri and I'm just surprised that they had enough players to make a team, but when your kicker is in your top three players, that's probably not a good sign. This wasn't the best game of the tournament. Missouri had little to no offense. New Jersey embarrassed themselves by making this a close game. The QBs turned into running backs and thankfully put some points on the board in the first half. Missouri almost put up the first safety of the tournament after Skylar Thompson tried running home on third and 23. And to wrap things up for this game, Jonathan Taylor made some big runs that resulted in a touchdown, but also a flying knee to the chin. Trust me, you didn't miss much in that game. New Jersey won 20-11 and will face Mississippi in the second round. Next is a less than fair matchup on paper. We have number five, California facing number 28, Utah. Utah has some solid players like Puka, Zach Wilson, and Dalton Schultz. But on the other hand, California has African Americans and a lot of them. This game looked like the first game back from summer camp and remember the Titans. In a six minute quarter game, California won 42 to six. Also, I put California on the Raiders, not because I think their time or jerseys in California was iconic. I'm just a dumbass and totally forgot that they're in Las Vegas now, but who knows? Give them a few more first round draft picks with a sports car and unlimited access to drugs and alcohol. And maybe this video will age well and we'll see them back in California. Next up, we have number 21, Indiana, facing number 12, Virginia. Indiana has a bunch of solid players on both sides of the field, but they also have 48 overall Danny Etling at QB, who is one of the worst quarterbacks in the entire game. So with Helen Keller throwing the ball, they didn't accomplish much in the first half. It didn't help that their defense was making heads up plays like this one. Still, their defense held their own in the red zone and kept the score at 6-0 going into the fourth quarter. They finally figured out their best chance was giving Chris Evans a ball and relying on their linemen, so they actually went up one point in the fourth quarter. And it was looking even better for Indiana after they made Virginia go three and out, but they roughed the kicker on the punt return and that killed all the momentum they ever had. Virginia ended up wasting valuable time while making their way upfield. They never could throw it into the end zone, so Tarah Taylor just ran it inside for the touchdown. And after seeing how easy that was, he just did it again on the two-point conversion, and Virginia earned themselves a comfortable seven-point lead. Indiana was able to move the ball to about midfield, but on fourth and six, they missed the first down by inches after a short pass. And Virginia is destined to get bent over in the next round against number five, California. We still haven't had a first-round upset so far, but number 13, Maryland versus number 20, Arizona. Arizona is fairer than it looks. Maryland has the Diggs brothers, but Arizona has Brock Purdy at QB and Mark Andrews at tight end. To start things off, Arizona got some big stops and good field position. Purdy was eventually able to connect with his tight end and brought the ball near the red zone. He then followed up on that act by throwing the ball in the dirt, but still Arizona went up 3-0. On the kickoff, Maryland had their best offensive play of the game so far and brought the ball to the 45 yard line. Kurt Benkert got a little jealous of that play, so he threw it to Arizona on the very next play. Purdy then finds Shahid for a 20-yard gain on their first play. He hits Colton in the red zone on the following play. But once again, they run out of juice in the red zone and settle for another field goal. Out of nowhere, Kurt Benkert made some beautiful throws and Maryland is within 20 yards of the end zone. But Cam Jordan comes up with a much needed sack and Arizona recovers the fumble. In the second half, Purdy is still struggling to survive in the pocket, so they have to punt it back. But Kurt Benkert is currently the best player for Arizona. He throws another interception and puts Arizona in great field position. And on first and 10, Purdy throws a tight spiral to Shahid, and they are on the one yard line with three minutes to go in the third. Bijan Robinson easily runs it in for the touchdown and for the two point conversion to put Arizona up 14. 
Maryland finds themselves on third and goal with four minutes left to go. But once again, Ben Kurt is a traitor. He gives it back to Arizona and number 20 Arizona is the first team to pull off the upset. Their reward for all that hard work is going to be facing number four, Florida. Number 29, Kentucky has some decent players, especially on defense, but Florida is stacked. Thanks to Lamar Jackson throwing it to the wrong team in the first half, Kentucky was only down three points going into the third. But in the second half, Florida's defense wasn't so nice to Kentucky's QB. Lamar made some smart plays to put them in scoring range, and Florida ran in a few touchdowns to win this game 30-10. to Moving on to the bottom side of the bracket, we have number 3 Georgia versus number 30 Oregon. Georgia is stacked with 90 and high 80 overall players, but when you look at their QBs, they have Justin Fields, who is scared to throw the ball, Deshaun Watson, who scares women, and Joshua Dobbs, who scares children. And Oregon may not have much, they are the lowest ranked team for a reason, but they have Justin Herbert. Herbert starts Oregon off strong with a big first down, but he gets sacked two times in a row and they're looking at third and 26. And his linemen aren't getting any better. He scrambles out of the pocket, but somehow he finds a man open deep downfield and moves the ball up to the 23 yard line. And after another first down, he decides to take it in himself and Oregon is up seven points against the number three team in the nation. Justin Fields comes out on offense looking like prime Michael Vick minus the organized crime. He spins out of the pressure for a first down. He throws another first down, but they get stopped on third and 10 and settle for the field goal. Georgia gets another stop on defense. Justin Fields pretends to be an actual quarterback for a while, but he runs himself into a deep sack, which leaves Georgia still down six to seven going into the second half. Oregon gets stopped on third and one midway through the third quarter, but they hit a deep field goal to put them up four. Georgia comes out with a bunch more weapons, but ends up doing the same thing, which puts them down one point with four and a half minutes to go. Herbert is out here fighting for his life, spinning out of pressure, throwing dimes just for his receivers to drop passes. But on the punt, they get saved by the refs and get a second chance. Herbert finds a few open receivers downfield. They get it within 10 yards of the goal line and Georgia is burning through their timeouts. They could have left Georgia with 30 seconds and no timeouts to score a touchdown, but Justin Herbert has a man so wide open in the end zone he has to hit him. Georgia gets the ball back with a minute 50 down eight and no timeouts. And on the first play, they move it up to the 45 yard line. No one guards the middle of the field, so they get another first down at the other 40. They throw it to the middle again. A man is wide open and it's down to the 25 yard line with less than a minute to go. But on the next play, Oregon steps up and gets the sack that sets Georgia back six yards. And on third and 16 with less than 10 seconds to go, Oregon decides to play man and Josh Downs is open in the end zone. And on the two point conversion, everyone is open. Fields finds Tyreek Hill and they have tied this game up with five seconds to spare. In overtime, Oregon starts off with the ball and gets two back to back first downs. But Justin Herbert gets the Justin Fields treatment. He gets sacked to make it third and 17. And again, he gets sacked to make it fourth and 26. And Georgia gets the ball back. They make no mistakes and casually find Darren Waller open in the end zone for the overtime win. They'll move on to the next round, but they look very beatable and undeserving of the three seed. The lucky states that have the chance to play Georgia next round are number 19, Iowa, and number 14, Michigan. I was born and raised in Iowa, so this is really where my bias lies, but I was unaware that Joe Burrow is from Ames. That's a classic Iowa move right there to have a high-end recruit in your backyard, but not signing them to any of your colleges. Iowa is always known as tight end university, so it's no surprise they have one of the best tight ends in the game. They have a pretty amazing offensive line for their population. And thanks to black people moving in from Chicago, we're lucky enough to have one decent wide receiver. Michigan is no walk in the park though. They've shown us that a few times in the charity Big Ten Championship games they play each other in. They're led by Max Crosby, Sauce Gardner, and Aiden Hutchinson. But Cooper Rush is a little bit further down the totem pole from Joe Burrow. Michigan starts the game off strong with some rushing first downs, but Rush ends up chucking the ball at the camera crew. Michigan holds Iowa to third and 10, but Joe Burrow throws a beauty to an open man downfield for a touchdown. Michigan responds with a few first downs that brings them to the 27 yard line. They take a shot at the end zone, but it's broken up, so they have to take the field goal. Joe Burrow is legitimately the best running back on Iowa's team, so he takes it from the 26 to the 46. He does it again for the first down before the two-minute warning. He hits his tight ends a few times to bring it to second and goal. And one of the few weapons he has, Alan Lazard, is open in the end zone to put Iowa up 14-3 before the end of the half. 
They get the ball back midway through the third, and Joe Burrow is fully prepared to abuse his tight ends for 70 yards straight, but Lewis intercepts it on first and 10. But Cooper Rush wants to be like Joe Burrow one day, so he throws it right back to the defense, and two plays later, Iowa has a fresh set of downs while only losing one yard in the process. And this game continues to be wild. On the following play, Joe Burrow hits a double-team Lazard. He breaks off the tackle and continues 40 yards upfield for a touchdown, and Iowa goes up 21-3. And that right there will secure the second upset of the first round for Iowa, beating Michigan 28 to 10. Next up, we have number 11, North Carolina facing number 22, Colorado. Colorado didn't have a QB entering this game, so they had to take the lowest available free agent, which ruined their chances before the game even started. The only chance they had is if Chris McCaffrey could have ran for 700 yards, but turns out he couldn't. North Carolina won this one, but it was nothing to be proud of. They only won by three points. Minnesota versus Ohio was another forgettable game. Minnesota has some talent, but they're pretty whitewashed. Trey Lance led his offense to a solid zero points, and even Russell Wilson was able to put up 27 on Minnesota. So Ohio will easily be moving on to the next round to face North Carolina. Number seven, Pennsylvania versus number 26, Washington was another unfair matchup. Washington started the season off with a few sub-60 overall QBs, and the top two players for Pennsylvania are Micah Parsons and Aaron Donald. Needless to say, Washington didn't have much going for them, and Pennsylvania had their way with them. PA won 24-0. Number 10, Alabama versus number 23, Oklahoma, was a more competitive matchup, even though Oklahoma is the second state coming into this without a QB. It still took Jameis Winston the whole first quarter before he could find a man in the end zone. Oklahoma is pretty much playing with a high school quarterback, quarterback, but they were still able to move the ball upfield and put up a field goal. Oklahoma's defense was able to get another stop. They drew the pass interference while on offense, and once again, they're staying in this game with a field goal. In the second half, James Winston had some troubles on offense, but he did set a record for the tournament. After a few sacks, he was looking at fourth and 45, which is pretty impressive. Oklahoma came back on offense again and is somehow continuing to move the ball upfield, but the inevitable finally happened in the fourth quarter. On first and 10, Marlon Humphrey picked off Oklahoma's QB. Alabama made some safe plays. Jameis Winston drew a 15-yard penalty, skill issue, but all they could do was score a field goal against a team that they should be blowing out. Oklahoma got the ball back on the 20-yard line with almost three minutes to go. Immediately, the high schooler delivers a dot 20 yards upfield. He then finds a man open in the middle, and they have cross midfield. But on third and seven, Oklahoma's offensive line had their CTE kick in. They froze, and that left the high schooler scrambling, which brought them back to fourth and 21. And with one last chance, to pull off a miracle he throws it deep downfield to a pretty open man but it's a bad pass and that will end Oklahoma's hopes. Alabama will face Pennsylvania in the second round and for the last game of the first round we have number 15 Wisconsin facing number 18 Tennessee. Both teams are pretty even Tennessee is fairly top heavy with skill position players which is a good issue to have and leading them at QB is Trevor Lawrence who is up to 84 overall. Wisconsin, on the other hand, is filled with high IQ, good work ethic type of fellas. And at QB, they have 56 overall James Morgan. On the third play of the game, Trevor Lawrence has Jawan Jennings wide open downfield and Tennessee goes up 7-0. After some back and forth stops, Trevor Lawrence hits another beauty and they get the ball to the other 36. They get stopped from there, but having a bad long snapper is a cheat code in this game. They draw the 15-yard penalty for roughing the kicker. So Tennessee gets another shot at putting this game out of reach, but TJ Watt says what's up to Trevor. Wisconsin finally gets things rolling with a big run from Melvin Gordon and a throw to one of their white guys. It's not Kittle, so to be honest, I don't know who it is. Again, their 56 overall QB throws another dot for the first down, and they're well within scoring range. And a few plays later, Melvin Gordon puts Wisconsin on the board before halftime. Trevor Lawrence is back on offense. This is one of the few times I've seen a quarterback get hot in this round, but they still can't reach the end zone. They hit the field goal and they're up six points. From here, Wisconsin gets more than a few chances to take the lead, but James Morgan sometimes can't make a wide open five yard lob pass. But when he feels like it, he'll hit some of the clutchest throws possible. And that brings us to the 37 yard line with 37 seconds remaining on fourth and 10. Only James Morgan knows if he wants Wisconsin to win. Well, he ends up throwing it into triple coverage which easily gets intercepted and ends Wisconsin's hopes. Tennessee is the third team 
to pull off an upset in the first round, but they'll have to try their luck again against number two Texas in the second round. Up first in the second round, we have South Carolina facing number one overall Louisiana. Again, South Carolina is a really solid team. They have great defense and wide receivers. It just depends on how their QBs do. And it looks like in this franchise mode, they're going with Dorian Thompson Robinson over Mason Rudolph. And for Louisiana, they really don't have a weakness. They have Justin Jefferson, CeeDee Lamb, Dak Prescott. The list just goes on. But you can take the man away from the Cowboys, but you can't take the Cowboys out of the man. First play of the game, Dak Prescott throws an interception. DTR takes over on offense, goes one for seven, but he has the balls to try his luck downfield. Dak Prescott just threw an interception, but the one good thing about consistent brain damage is you have a bad short-term memory. He launches that thing downfield and Justin Jefferson is open and puts Louisiana on the board. South Carolina gets back on offense. They get a nice first down. Things are looking up for them and Patrick Sertan picks them off. Louisiana follows that up with a drive that never had the ball touch the grass and they easily scored another touchdown. South Carolina Carolina finally proved that they could stop Louisiana and force them to punt, but Louisiana is so good they even have stud punters on their team. They drop that one in at the one yard line. South Carolina tries to run it out of the end zone, but Jordan Davis forces the safety and Louisiana is up 16. And just about as soon as it started, this one is over. Louisiana went up 20 points in the first half and never looked back. Up next, we have number nine, Mississippi taking on number eight, New Jersey. Both teams are pretty evenly matched, but we just have another battle of the mid going on at QB between Kenny Pickett and Gardner Minshew. These two teams came out in the first half and played some of the worst football I've ever seen. There's not much to see here besides the low lights both teams came out with three points surely these two can't keep playing at such a low level in the second half and Gardner Minshew turns it over both QBs had to work together to make it happen but finally we get the first touchdown of the game Pickett finds Dotson and New Jersey's up seven Mississippi ends up running the ball a few times and they make it 54 yards upfield in two plays and to top it off Minshew makes a nice read he finds Mingo in the end zone and the game is tied again at 10 these two teams accomplished nothing for eight minutes straight but New Jersey is starting to catch fire on third and one pacheco runs right into the mississippi d line but no one there is capable of tackling him so he earns the first down in a wise move they keep it out of pickett's hand again and taylor earns him 13 yards but on first and 10 pickett is determined to win the battle of mid he finds a man open in the end zone new jersey goes up 17 to 10 with three minutes to go but gardner Minshew has woken up he realizes he has aj brown and dk metcalf on his team so he just kept feeding them and eventually that resulted in a touchdown with little over two minutes to go new jersey has a clock on their side and they get a quick first down before the two minute warning they make a gutsy decision to run the ball but jonathan and Taylor gets him another first down. Kenny Pickett is so back. He finds an open man downfield. They keep it in bounds, and now Mississippi is calling timeouts. And it seems like they finally realize that Jonathan Taylor has better feet than Kenny Pickett. They hand it off to him, and he takes care of the rest. New Jersey goes up seven points, and on the tying drive, Mississippi gets it to the 21-yard line with one play remaining. Minshew quickly gets it out, and that would have tied it up if only the end zone was five yards longer. And in number five, California versus number 12, Virginia no surprises here California put up 27 unanswered points Virginia ended up scoring near the end to Rod Taylor had to put his body on the line to save them from getting shut out but this game was never close and California will move on to the third round number 20 Arizona shocked Maryland to get here but they were in for a whole different ball game against number four Florida their O-line struggled in the first game and they struggled even more against one of the best teams ever assembled Florida had a rough night on offense but still found a way to get points on the board Brock Purdy entered the fourth quarter throwing 10 for 22 for 78 yards. Arizona fought their hardest to keep it within 20, but this game was never in question. And I think everyone saw this matchup coming between number five, California, and number four, Florida, in the third round. Up next on the bottom side of the bracket, we have number three, Georgia, taking on number 19, Iowa. Iowa got the ball first and slowly but surely moved the chains upfield with nothing more than a 10-yard pass at a time. That worked all the way up to the 13-yard line before Joe Burrow threw a piss missile laser to Alan Lazard for a touchdown. Justin Fields took over on offense and is once again and holding the Bears back. He threw a 22-yard first down, then Nick Chubb took the ball, ran around Iowa's defense, then threw it, and landed on the 14-yard line. Iowa doesn't have any real defensive tackles, so from there, Georgia ran through them for a touchdown, and the game is tied at 7. Iowa went back to their simple and sound offense of short throws, but TJ Hawkinson found some open space and took it 23 yards upfield. 
Iowa then had a breakdown that set them back to second and 22, but Joe Burrow just wanted a challenge. He found his only wide receiver open and Iowa is on the other 36. From there, Joe Burrow proved he is the most athletic man to ever come out of a corn state and took it in himself for another touchdown. Justin Fields answered back by doing what he does best. Joe Burrow managed to get the ball to the 22 yard line before being sacked, but three points is three points and Iowa is now up seven to 17. Fields made the luckiest play of his career, not because he did anything well, but because somehow this wasn't ruled a fumble. Iowa got the ball back with four minutes left in the half and ever so slowly made their way up the field, which ended up in Joe Burrow finding TJ Hawkinson open in the end zone for yet another touchdown. And just when I thought this half was over, Justin Fields stepped up his game again. He found his way out of the pocket for a big run just to be met by two Iowans who caused a fumble. One more good throw later and Iowa is up 7-27 to before halftime and that all but puts his game out of reach. Georgia was able to put some more points up in the second half, but they weren't able to stop Iowa's Joe Burrow-led offense. So Iowa will be moving on to the quarterfinals after taking out number three Georgia 24 to 34. Number 11, North Carolina versus number six, Ohio was a predictable outcome. In the first round, North Carolina barely beat Colorado who didn't have a quarterback while Ohio completely shut out Minnesota. Ohio's defense dominated again in the first half between their sacks and interceptions. They went up 20. 7-0 before the end of the second quarter, but North Carolina had their brightest moment of the tournament so far when Braxton Berrios took the ball 97 yards into the end zone out of the kickoff. Still, Ohio went on to easily win this one 18-37. It didn't look too bad on paper, but this game was never in question. Number 7, Pennsylvania versus number 10, Alabama made for a much more competitive game than the last few. Both teams are loaded up on defense, but then in the QB position, it's Bryce Young versus James Winston. Pennsylvania opened up their offense with a deep ball on third and seven to Kyle Pitts, who took it 50 yards across the field. Swift took things even further with another first down, but on third and 11, Bryce Young panicked his way out of bounds instead of running for a touchdown, so they only scored three on this drive. Both teams were then manhandled by the opposing team's defense for a few minutes straight. We make it to the second quarter, and Jameis Winston might be looking like a new man. Nope, he throws an interception out of the gates. Well, Bryce Young can't do any worse than that. Wait a minute. Yes, he can. He throws an interception on first and 10. And I guess Alabama, or more more so, James Winston had this thing planned out from the beginning because as soon as they got the ball back on offense, they turned it on and found Nico Collins for a touchdown. We had a few more possessions of getting stopped on downs, but it turns out the defense is gaining more yards than the offense in this game. Bryce Young throws a beautiful ball to Marlon Humphrey, who happens to be on the other team, and Humphrey takes it all the way back for a touchdown to put Alabama up 14-3. Again, these quarterbacks were running these offenses like a poorly oiled machine, but Bryce Young has us covered. He gets sacked, Alabama recovers covers it and they are all set with perfect field position with a minute to go in the half. Yet somehow Alabama never gains a first down, but they'll take their three points and go up 17 to three in the half. In the second half, not much changed, but somehow weird things kept on happening. I'm showing a punt, which is never good news. Pennsylvania tries to run this ball out. He hits sticks air, fumbles it, and Alabama once again does it again. They retire Winston's arm on this drive and it works out. Bijan Robinson runs it in for a touchdown to put Alabama up 24 to three, which pretty much puts his game away. It wasn't the prettiest game of football. Winston forgot how to throw. Young either took a bribe or has the smoothest hands in football. And either way, Alabama is moving on after upsetting number seven, Pennsylvania, 31 to 13. The only game that leaves us with in the second round is number 18, Tennessee versus number two, Texas. If you assume Texas would be stacked with talent, I hate to break it to you. But yeah, you'd be correct. At this point in the season, they have 399 overall players between Trent Williams, Miles Garrett, and Patrick Mahomes. There's only about 10 players that aren't 80 overall or higher. Their only weakness is that their best running back is an 84 overall, but still, they'll be fine. I know Tennessee is a better team than I expected in the beginning, but they really met their maker in this one. Let's just say Texas never had to punt the ball in the first half. They did whatever they wanted to Tennessee for 36 minutes straight. They were up 35 to 7 at halftime and finished the game with an all-time high in points by a team this tournament so far. They won 52 to 14 and are easily moving on to the quarterfinals to face 10 seed Alabama. We are now in the quarterfinals and up first we have top seed Louisiana facing 8 seed New Jersey. Just to recap, New Jersey is a well-balanced team on both sides of the field. Their main issue is Kenny Pickett, who is either Joe Burrow or James Morgan, just depends on the minute. Louisiana, like Texas, is better described not as a team with strengths, but more so just a team with zero weaknesses. 
Louisiana starts off with the ball and gets two quick first downs, but just like the last time we saw Dak Prescott, he throws an interception on the first drive of the game. But to be fair, he made a solid tackle that might have saved them from the pick six. Pickett actually is getting some time in the pocket to think this game, and he opens up with a few first down throws. From there, they give the ball to Jonathan Taylor and get out of his way. And somehow, number eight, New Jersey, currently has the edge on number one, Louisiana. Now that Dak has gotten that turnover out of his system, he proceeds to dominate the field and make three excellent passes in a row that results in a Justin Jefferson touchdown. I've seen enough of Kenny Pickett by now to know that somehow, some way, he's going to put some points up on the board for the other team, but he shocked me on this drive. He threw some tough passes that brought New Jersey to the 12-yard line, and from there, Joku took over and brought it home to put New Jersey up again 14-7. Louisiana came right back in New Jersey. They gave it to Etienne, who ran through a defensive lineman and proceeded to gain 24 yards. They realized how easy that was, so again, they just let this little Derrick Henry run right through the entire state. And after moving it to the 23-yard line, Dak threw it towards the end zone, but once again, he is picked off, and New Jersey looks like they can actually win this game. A few minutes later, New Jersey is back at their own 30 on first and 10, and now of all times, they try letting Pickett run wild with it, which results in a turnover and great field position for Louisiana. They easily capitalize on the opportunity with Morrow, but just when New Jersey looked broken, Kenny Pickett has the greatest drive of all time. He delivers four passes in a row on the button with each one being tougher than the last, and he ends up finding Robbie Chosen in the end zone to put them up 14 to 21. In the two-minute drill, Louisiana Indiana does get to the red zone, but New Jersey doesn't let them get into the end zone. So going into halftime, New Jersey still holds a four point lead on the top seed Louisiana team. Now I told you Kenny Pickett has two modes, Joe Burrow or James Morgan. He came out looking like James Morgan in the second half. He immediately risked it all and throws an interception. Louisiana then methodically moved the ball upfield. They looked unstoppable, but here we go. Dak Prescott saves the day and throws another interception to Mika in the end zone. But it didn't count for too much because New Jersey was stopped on downs and Louisiana, just like Ben Roethlisberger, won't take no for an answer. Even after a drop in the end zone on third and goal, they pop a pill and lock the door. Dak Prescott delivers and Louisiana takes their first lead of the the game with nine and a half minutes remaining and from there it didn't stop louisiana gets a few more stops and a few more touchdowns and they're going to the final four after taking out their toughest challenge yet but now it is time for what could have very well been the championship game. Number five, California is meeting number four, Florida. Winner faces top seed, Louisiana. I didn't go over these two teams' rosters much earlier because it was so obvious we would see them again. But Florida is being led by Nick Bosa, then arguably the best running quarterback and the best running back in the league. Their defense is especially stacked and likely the best of all states. They only have 190 plus wide receiver, but the rest are all above 80. And also I moved Gabe Davis. Davis to tight end to fill that hole for them. California is led by 98 overall Fred Warner, Tyron Smith, and Devontae Adams. Of course, you have Josh Allen at quarterback, Joe Mixon at halfback, possibly the best wide receiver room, and Michael Thomas at tight end. California came out strong in this one with some first down runs and throws. They looked like they had the first touchdown of the game, but for no reason, Tyron Smith was illegally downfield. Josh Allen then gets sacked, so they have to settle for three. Florida gets the ball and is on a mission, and just two plays, they move the ball from the 18-yard line to the other 34-yard line, just on the ground. Lamar then finds Calvin Ridley open near the end zone, and they are looking at first and goal. It worked the first time, so they do it again. Lamar nails the upper 90, and Calvin Ridley scores the first touchdown of the game. California gets back on offense and moves the chains quickly, but on second and 12, Josh Allen throws a risky pass, and Darius Williams comes away with the interception. Florida kept their offense pretty simple on this drive. They gave it to Lamar and got out of his way. That brought them to the six-yard line, and from there, Lamar found Gabe Davis open in the end zone to put Florida up 14 to three. Josh Allen has a lot of making up to do, so he gets to it. He takes it himself and hits the nastiest QB juke in NFL history and ends up with 25 yards on the rush. He gets a nice throw in before the end of the first quarter, but the story of this drive is that Josh Allen is essentially Barry Sanders in a lighter skin tone. And to cap off this drive, Josh Allen gives it away just to boost the morale of his team and Joe Mixon makes it a four point game. Florida is back on offense and Lamar still has not missed. And between him and Derrick Henry, they run the ball to first and goal, which results in an easy Derrick Henry touchdown. Josh Allen and California are back on offense, and it looks like these settings have been fixed, but I swear they are not 
these teams are just stacked. And for further proof, Josh Allen gives a prime example of that when he throws the ball out of bounds instead of throwing it to the wide open man, which means California is going to have to settle for another field goal and stay down eight points. Florida again cruises their way downfield, but for the first time in the game, not only did Lamar not complete a pass, but they were stopped from reaching the end zone. That field goal put them up 11 before the half, but California still has time to put up some much needed points, except Josh Allen throws it right towards the Republicans, and Florida is going to come out of the half with another three points putting them up 13 to 27 at the half but it never ends with these offenses california gets a ball with 20 seconds they get it to midfield with one throw then to the 29 yard line and out of bounds on the next which easily gives them a field goal making it 16 to 27 florida going into halftime california has a ball to start off the half but they are in deep shit looking at third and 24 they make a great effort to make it fourth and one but they have low testosterone over here so they punt it lamar has the ball back and doesn't look like he's slowing down his first attempt takes it 25 yards upfield but finally california catches a break lamar throws it to cameron curl for the interception California gets rolling again. It takes them three minutes to make it to the red zone, but they get stopped on downs again, and they take the field goal on fourth and 13 to bring the game back with an eight. Florida is past midfield, and Lamar finds Gabe Davis wide open downfield. California is lucky that wasn't a touchdown. They get lucky again after stopping Derrick Henry on third and goal, but Florida does not care about their feelings. They go for the kill, and they get it. Amari Cooper puts Florida up 34 to 19 going into the fourth quarter. California has no room for air now and Josh Allen starts him off strong with a 33 yard pass to Devonte Adams. Josh Allen is hot which can make things interesting but they decide to hand it off to Joe Mixon which actually works out for a first down. What also works is letting that thing fly. Once they got it to first and goal Josh Allen also let that thing hang out and get some air and took it in himself for a touchdown. Florida has the ball up eight with six minutes to go. They could put the game away here so on third and three Lamar goes for the kill but it's broken up. California gets a ball back on their own 27 yard line and needs something big to happen. So they find Devonte Adams who breaks the tackle and brings it all the way home for a touchdown. They call it back to the one yard line, but Joe Mixon spits on it and puts it back in. They go for the tying two point conversion and Josh Allen finds Michael Thomas and it is all tied up again. But they might've just woken up a black beast. Lamar has the ball and is still hot. Florida starts to drive off with two big and easy first downs. Lamar then takes it one step further and runs it all the way to the 24 yard line. And within scoring range on first and 10, Lamar throws a short pass, which is intercepted. Lamar tries catching him but even he can't Trent McDuffie just turned this game around and California is now up seven with less than three minutes to go and now all of a sudden Florida doesn't look so Florida-y they have to go for it on fourth and four but somehow they get it even in tough coverage and on third and ten Lamar looks deep and has a man open Gabe Davis brings it in for the tying touchdown California gets a ball back with a minute left and Josh Allen goes deep on his first try but it is broken up and Nick Folk one of the best kickers in the game is getting ready but the target line is the 36 yard line on the next play Allen finds Ayuk for the first down and the out of bounds. He looks deep from their own 33 and it's Ayuk again who could have gone much further with a better ball but again he stops the clock. They are now at the target line for the field goal but Joe Mixon makes it a little bit easier and brings it to the 30 yard line. Florida calls a timeout to ice the kicker but Nick Folk is not missing this. He nails it from 46 yards out. He puts California up three with seven seconds remaining and that is the ball game. Number five California is moving on to face number one Louisiana in the semifinals. It's going to be hard to top that, but number 19 Iowa is going to try to keep the Cinderella team alive by taking out number six Ohio. Just a reminder of what Iowa is working with they have all free agents at running back, they have Lazard and Akers at wide receiver, but to be fair, the worst free agents are better than Akers. Hawkinson is a very solid 92, but what's gotten this team here in the first place is the offensive line and, of course, Joe Burrow. Half of their defense is linebackers, so they're filling in at defensive ends and tackles. And the only player in the entire backfield that isn't from free agency is Riley Moss, the greatest white cornerback in the league. Ohio has Russell Wilson at quarterback, which is what it is, but they also have real weapons like 86 overall David Montgomery, a full wide receiver room, both Kelsey brothers, and an all-around 
solid defense. Iowa had the first real drive of the game, which of course only included passes to the tight ends and Joe Burrow running for his life. By the time they got to first and goal, all they had to do was give it to one of their bot running backs and they scored an easy touchdown. Ohio responded by giving it to David Montgomery over and over. He brought them to the red zone and from there, Russell Wilson connected to Ashton Doolin to tie the game at seven. Iowa started to make their running backs look like Adrian Peterson, but I swear to you, they are not good. It's just their blockers. Although they were stopped on fourth and inches, but Iowa says screw it. Joe Burrow hasn't missed yet and he doesn't miss here. But on third and nearly goal, Burrow starts to feel some pressure, which is a new feeling for him. So they have to settle for three points. Ohio gets back on offense. And again, Iowa struggles to contain the run, but I don't think Russell Wilson will be leaving the pocket much more after that hit. On third and 11, Russell runs out of the pocket and towards the side line there is an open path to a touchdown right in front of him but he throws it out of bounds and Ohio hits the field goal. Iowa goes back to offense and has instant success in the air and on the ground. Travis who TJ Hawkinson catches it runs through a defender and picks up 20 yards and Joe Burrow rolls to his left and hits Isaiah Coulter in his stride to give Iowa another touchdown to put them up 17 to 10. Third and 12 Ohio goes for the screen they get some big blocks up front but from behind Jack Campbell gets the clutch stop. I was back on offense. It's third and 10. They're looking to avoid the three and out but Ohio gives Joe Burrow too much time to relax and he finds who else but Alan Lazard open downfield with room to run and he takes it in for a touchdown, which puts Iowa up 24 to 10. Ohio doesn't look out of it yet. They work hard for a first down. They follow up that set of downs by Van Ginkle sacking them and they might be out of it now. Iowa comes out again, making some smart plays that puts them in scoring range and Joe Burrow is the greatest QB of all time. He throws an absolute beauty downfield. Deontay Spencer comes down with it Iowa is up 31 to 10 in the third quarter and this game is pretty much over. Iowa pulls off another upset and is moving on once again after taking out number six Ohio 44 to 24. And for the last game of the quarterfinals we have number 10 Alabama taking on number two Texas. Alabama gets the ball at the start of the game and Bajan takes off for 17 yards. James Winston then hits George Pickens in his stride to bring the ball to the 24 yard line and he follows that up with another dot to Jalen Tolbert and Texas is losing for the first time yet. Texas didn't appreciate that so they quickly moved the ball upfield to the other 30 yard line but Quinn and Williams puts an end to that run with a negative 13 yard sack but you see the thing is Patrick Mahomes really does this for a living he comes right back at him with a 31 yard pass to Mike Evans and the problem solved they then pitch it to a chan and the game is tied up Winston runs into the same problem when he's sacked for 11 yards but yeah this man is not Patrick Mahomes Texas gets the ball back Patrick then threw a few tight spirals over some mountains and found Jalen Waddle in the end zone for a touchdown but Alabama again is finding some success with the running game Bajan goes wide left and takes it 31 yards upfield Winston puts Alabama in trouble when he forgets which way he's supposed to run towards but on third and 22 he made one of the best plays of his professional career and found Nico Collins for the tying touchdown and I think that really just set Texas off from there I'm not sure how else to break this to any of you Alabamans out there but Texas went on to score 23 unanswered points they were picking off James Winston left and right, abusing him in front of his entire state and team, and they did whatever they wanted on offense. Texas is moving on to the final four to play Iowa after winning this one 27 to 54. Up first, we have number one, Louisiana versus number five, California. I moved some more wide receivers to tight end on both sides for this one. Michael Pittman is now a 92 overall tight end for California, and CeeDee Lamb is now a 99 overall tight end for Louisiana. California is going to start off with the ball in this one. They make it 20 yards or so out of the end zone, meet heavy traffic, and turn the ball over. And Odell Beckham Jr., of all people, picks it up and runs in for a touchdown. Again, Josh Allen has his work cut out for him, but on his first attempt, he finds an open St. Brown 42 yards downfield. A few plays later, he finds Zach Ertz open on the sideline, who slowly tries to make his way in for a touchdown, but the one-yard line will do. Joe Mixon patches this drive up after diving through a lineman and time the game up. Once Louisiana got the ball, California's defense seemed to disappear. They had no problem getting the ball to first and goal, but once they got there, they had a whole bunch of problems, which ended with Dak throwing it towards the sideline and a three-point lead for Louisiana. Louisiana got a quick stop and the ball back, and once again, they torched California in the open field. Just like the Russians in Stalingrad, these guys did not take one step back. They rolled through them for 80 yards straight, and on second and goal, Dak found an open Justin Jefferson for the 
the 10 point lead. On third and 13, California had the bright idea to go for a screen pass, which obviously didn't work and they had to take the three pointer, but you can count on Dak Prescott to be reliable. I think he's had a first quarter interception in every game so far, and he doesn't fail to deliver in this one. And even though California couldn't ask for a better field position, they get stopped in their tracks again. They get another field goal, but they're still down four points. And we might need a random drug test after this throw. First and 10 from their own 17 yard line, Dak Prescott launches it from the 10 yard line to the other 20 yard line to hit Jamar Chase in stride for a touchdown. You see shit like that is why you can't expect to win by kicking field goals against this team. California is struggling to slow down Louisiana's offense again, and they have it on the 10 yard line. But if you can't stop them, you can always hope Dak Prescott just misses his target by five feet. But still, Louisiana goes up 27 to 16. And California just keeps digging themselves a bigger hole. The very first play back on offense, Josh Allen makes it real easy for Devin White to catch this and return it for a pick six. Thankfully for California's sake, their defense is holding Louisiana back from running away with this game. And now that Josh Allen has that all out of his system, he starts gaining momentum and pushing the ball downfield. But from the 18 yard line, he's looking for the end zone, but he throws it away again. This time, to Tredavious White. Clearly, Josh Allen has been in Buffalo too long and loves white people a little bit too much. California gets the ball back before the end of the half and manages to sneak in a field goal, but going into the half 34 to 19 with two interceptions and a fumble at the very beginning of the game has to be the opposite of how they had this game planned out. They have come back before against a very tough Florida team, but they just keep failing to convert near the end zone in this one. And Dak Prescott refuses to take his foot off the gas. He has some of the best receivers on the planet, so it's a given they're going to move the ball upfield with those guys. But Dak was able to run for a first down and try truck the best California player Fred Warner in the process. So that's a bit demoralizing. To make things even worse, Eddie N catches it near the sideline. Two California players run right past him and they're looking at another touchdown. California does come back to make some positive gains and they even end this drive with a touchdown. But even after Ayuk scores, he doesn't want to celebrate. He just wants to go home. Louisiana is up 12 and another touchdown might put this game out of reach. So Dak Prescott steps up once again and throws it away to the fattest California man on the field. California was given another opportunity to come back into this game, but all they can do is go for a field goal and even that's no good. Still, California is able to get another stop, but they get the ball back on their own 10 yard line. But for the first time in this game, Josh Allen doesn't miss. He brings them all the way up to the other 21 yard line and hands it off to Joe Mixon, who was able to run right past the defense for a touchdown to make it a five point game. And again, California's defense has figured out the Louisiana offense. They stopped them at midfield and California somehow has a chance to take the lead. They start at their own 20 yard line, but start off with a 19 yard gain thanks to Devontae Adams. Joe Mixon then takes it midfield and then some for another 19 yard gain they then find a covered Ayuk who catches it breaks off the tackle and takes it to the 13 yard line third and two they have all the momentum in the world Josh Allen throws it towards the end zone but he Dak Prescott's it it's off they go for it on fourth and two they hand it to Joe Mixon but he misses a gap he runs into three defenders and they turn it over on downs. And that will end up settling this ball game. Louisiana kills some time while making their way towards a field goal. California goes for a Hail Mary that didn't even reach the end zone and Louisiana will eliminate number five California and move on to the championship. And for the other semifinal, we have number 19, Iowa versus number two, Texas. I never thought I would have to make this Iowa roster so much, but here we are. Although this is probably where it ends, Texas has Iowa beat at every single position with the exception of tight end. And Texas makes their presence known quickly. They move the ball upfield however they felt like it. And when it came down to first and goal, Texas's linemen were too much for Iowa's linebackers playing defensive tackle. Iowa comes out abusing their running game and it gets them past midfield. But on first and 10, Texas brings the pressure. I'm thinking Burroughs throwing it out of bounds, but no, this man finds a wide open receiver near the end zone and ties up the game. Iowa uses every ounce of athleticism to slow down Texas's offense, but it only took a few plays. And once again, Patrick finds a man open in the end zone. Clearly Iowa's defense can't contain Texas's offense. So they're just gonna have to go for a shootout with them. So Joe Burrow uses every weapon he has to keep Iowa in this game. He uses his lightning fast speed, TJ Hawkinson. 
TJ Hawkinson again, can't blame him. But on third and inches, he has to throw it to his free agent running back and Texas comes up with the first stop of the game. Mahomes makes a few more amazing plays and he ends up finding Cortland Sutton for yet another touchdown. And Joe Burrow might've finally found a defense that is more athletic than him. He gets sacked on third and 16 and Iowa comes up empty handed on this drive. But Patrick Mahomes comes out and does even worse on first and 10. He gets picked off by 68 overall Ben Nyman. That rejuvenates his Iowa team and Joe Burrow immediately completes one of the toughest passes I have ever seen in this game. He follows that up with another tough one with no room for error to who else but TJ Hawkinson and on second and goal they give it to little Stevie Scott who takes it to the end zone to make it a four point game. Iowa almost comes up with another ginormous stop after causing the fumble but Texas recovers it and makes up for it and to top off that big gain Iowa gets called for the face mask but Coach is right. If we want to win, it's on us. Iowa holds the line and stops Texas from scoring in the red zone. Iowa is down seven and Joe Burrow likes that number. Pause. After several short distance throws in a row, they make it to the seven yard line and he lobs a beauty to you guessed it, TJ Hawkinson. I swear Texas never starts slow on offense. Patrick finds an open man who takes it 50 yards downfield, but Iowa is killing it in the short field. They hold off Texas again and they have to take the long field goal. That means Iowa now has a chance to take the lead before the half and Joe Burrow is interested. On third and three, he finds Lazard for a big gain. They're within field goal range, but Joe Burrow wants the whole thing. He goes back to his only receiver again, and Lazard comes down with it near the 10-yard line. And on third and goal, Joe Burrow throws it into tight traffic, and TJ Hawkinson once again gets another touchdown. And Iowa is up 30-27 to going into the half. Texas gets a stop in the ball back after halftime, and Patrick Mahomes is leaning forward in his gaming chair for the first time all tournament. He goes to his number one guy Mike Evans twice in a row and gives him another touchdown and gives Texas a three-point lead. I don't know how Texas hasn't caught on yet but Joe Burrow pretty much has two targets on the field and it's TJ Hawkinson once again who takes it from their 22 to the other 34. Texas gets three stops in a row, but still that's good enough for Shudak to come in and tie this game up. On third and 10, Patrick Mahomes makes a run for it, but these Iowa boys don't take kindly to that fancy arrogant play style. They get the three and out. We get several more stops in a row and we are deep into the third quarter, but Joe Burrow once again finds his good Caucasian friend open downfield and TJ brings it to the other 47. Iowa gets another first down before being stopped on downs, but it's enough to put Iowa on top of the heavily favored Texas team again. Near the end of the third quarter, Patrick puts together a good string of throws. Even though the eight Iowa linebackers are all over them after the catch, these guys do not drop balls. And eventually, Patrick finds Cortland Sutton for another touchdown, and Texas is back up four. We're in the fourth quarter now, but that changes nothing for this Iowa team. They stick to the fundamentals. They do the same thing over and over. They throw it for a short gain to either TJ or Lazard and clear out the way for little Stevie. Everything goes according to plan, and Iowa is once again holding a three-point lead over Texas with 11 minutes to go. But when Patrick is trying, there's nothing this Iowa defense can do to stop him. And when he connects with Mike Evans, these free agent corners just seem to freeze up. And from the two-yard line, they give it to A-Chan, who trucks over an Iowa lineman for the four-point lead. Iowa isn't given up yet. Joe Burrow finds his couple of receivers a few times in a row and puts them within scoring range. But on third and five, the unthinkable happens. Joe Burrow misses his target. But on fourth and five, he makes a pass that even his free agents can catch. On second and goal, Lazard is open in the end zone, but he tries to put him on a TikTok, and Lazard can't come down with it. And even worse, are going for the field goal while down four with five minutes remaining. But in Joe Burrow, we trust. He knew what was coming. Patrick Mahomes whiffs on his throw for the first time of the game and they have to punt it back. They have four minutes to score and with the amount of short throws they make, they might just take the rest of the game to do it. To no surprise, he only trusts TJ and Lazard in this moment and they are within the red zone with less than two minutes to go. They get it to first and goal and are still wasting crucial time for Texas, but 
Texas opens up the border on first down and they sack Joe Burrow. Iowa makes Texas waste all of their timeouts, but they end up having to take the field goal with a minute to go. But the last man you want to have going up against you in this situation is Patrick Mahomes. And to make matters worse, their kicker is Justin Tucker. And on Texas's first play of the drive, Patrick finds an open man. He hits him in his stride and they get it to the other 39, which means this game should be all but over. But Patrick wants to make it a little easier for the greatest kicker of all time. So he throws it again, but Riley Moss comes out of nowhere and picks him off. That was the greatest feat of white athleticism I have ever seen. The true Iowa native has just flipped this tournament on its side. This looks so rigged. I hate it and I love it. Even though I'm from Iowa, it wasn't supposed to go down like this. I didn't even know Joe Burrow was from Iowa. If I'm being honest, with all due respect, Texas has to be the number one football state. But Iowa just has those sneaky, athletic, hard work, and good locker room presence, white guys. And for once, it actually paid off in a video game. So that means in the championship, we have number one, Louisiana taking on number 19, Iowa. It's a given that Iowa is going to struggle to slow down the best offense ever assembled. But even if the opposing defense is blind and dumb, it's still a given that Dak Prescott will throw an interception in the first quarter. Sadly, Joe Burrow came out not looking too Joe Burrow-y. He didn't throw the most incredible pass in the end zone to one of the worst wide receivers in the league on their first drive, and I am shocked. Dak Prescott has the best weapons this game has to offer on the field, but he's never faced an all-Iowan defense in the short field before. They get stopped next to the end zone and have to take the three and Joe Burrow might have used all of his luck up against Texas he gets back on offense and throws it right to the defense for an interception that hasn't happened since Michigan and with such good field positioning Louisiana finds Devontae Smith for a touchdown and they go up 10 but Joe Burrow said he found himself a third option today he finds Matt Landers on back-to-back -back big plays and Iowa is on the scoreboard for the first time this game and back to Iowa facing the greatest offense ever assembled it doesn't work out too well for them they don't come close to stopping them and before you know it justin jefferson is grittying on the ref joe burrow comes out in the second quarter and gives it the old iowa try but his linemen finally get outmatched and he takes a big sack that leaves them in steph curry range Iowa gets another big stop. They keep hacking away at this Louisiana defense, but it's deja vu. They let my white Jesus get sacked, and it is 13 to 17. Iowa's Anthony Nelson thought he made the biggest play of his career when he sacked Prescott for a 10-yard loss. But for real, fuck it. Justin Jefferson's got to be down there somewhere. Louisiana still finds a way to get a field goal in before the end of the half, and they are up seven. The second half started off pretty slow as both teams went back and forth kicking field goals for 12 minutes straight. But eventually Dak figured out that he now has the best tight end in the game, C.D. Lamb, and he's always had the best receiver. He makes an awful pass towards the end zone, but of course Justin Jefferson figures it out for him. Joe Burrow has to respond quickly, and that he does. On third and five, he throws another interception, which goes against everything I have seen this man do for the entirety of the video. And he couldn't have made it much easier for Louisiana. Etienne runs past the invisible Iowa defensive line, and C.D. Lamb finishes up the drive with a touchdown touchdown that puts Louisiana up 19 to 37. But just when you think Joe Burrow and Iowa are out of this game, this brother pops us in and gets to work. On third and two, he rolls out of the pocket like he's left-handed, but suddenly remembers he's right-handed and throws a dot to none other than TJ Hawkinson. And the future Hall of Famer Stevie Scott III carries a man into the end zone with him and puts Iowa back in this game. On third and three, Louisiana does something I didn't even know they were capable of. They drop a pass and Iowa has the ball back. Joe Burrow takes it back to the old days and turns himself into a running back and before you know it, they are in scoring position and he hits an open Puka Williams for the touchdown and they want the two-point conversion so Joe Burrow is going to get it himself. His own teammate tries to tackle him at the goal line but he still gets it done and Iowa is now within three points of Louisiana. Iowa has to continue getting stops or continue getting two-minute touchdowns and I guess it'll be the latter because they left Justin Jefferson wide open for an easy touchdown down. But Stevie Scott comes out and gets one of the greatest runs in of his career, which brings them to the 30-yard line. On third and five, Burrow finds TJ open, and they are now just within eight yards of the end zone. But on third and goal, the free agent players finally catch up to Iowa. Joe Burrow has an open man right next to the goal line, but he drops it. And Iowa being Iowa, they go 
go for the field goal. Now it's all up to one of the worst defenses in the tournament getting a stop on one of the best offenses in the tournament. And the second play of the drive ended up looking like the football version of the Harlem Globetrotters, which pretty much sums up how this is going to go. Etienne managed to burn all of Iowa's timeouts and any chance at coming back. And on third and nine, they could have ran it, hit the field goal, secured the victory. But no, they want to get Justin Jefferson his bonus check and he wants to hit the gwitty. So that'll wrap up this game and the tournament. Number one, Louisiana has won it all. They beat the unbeatable number 19, Iowa, 37 to 51. Honestly, I still wish Texas wouldn't have choked that game away. I think Texas could have beaten Louisiana, but respectfully, it would have been close. This was a long one, so I don't know if I should be sorry or to beg you for a subscription. But I enjoyed making this video. I just think I bit off more than I could chew. But at the same time, I didn't want to cut out any corners and leave out states. Because if I'm a guy watching this from Wisconsin, I would want to see my state in this. Even if I'm a dumb fucking Packers fan. So just know, I thought of all you random people and made myself suffer for it. But not to twist each other's dicks too much. Much love. Go subscribe. Uh, yeah, I'll see you in the next one.